So this is exciting. This whole this whole conference has been exciting for me to introduce friends and heroes, and uh, Ben is both of those actually for me. Um, he's going to talk about MDMA assisted psychotherapy, a child psychiatrist's perspective. Can I ask these folks to take the conversations into the back? Excuse me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, this is a plenary session, so people are coming in and out a little bit more than usual. Um, uh, consulting uh, child and adolescent, uh, Dr. Ben Sessa is a consulting child and adolescent psychiatrist working in adult addiction services and with custodial detained young people in a secure adolescent setting. He trained at University College London Medical School, graduating in 1997. He's interested in the developmental trajectory from child maltreatment to adult mental health disorders. Dr. Sessa is currently a senior research fellow at Bristol, Cardiff, and Imperial College London Universities, where he's conducting the UK's first clinical studies with MDMA-assisted therapy for the treatment of PTSD and alcohol dependence syndrome. In the last 10 years, he's worked on several UK-based human pharmacology trials as a study doctor or as a healthy subject, which is wonderful to know that the study doctor will have had the uh, substances himself by being a subject and will have been subjected to the studies. Um, administering and receiving test doses of LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, DMT, and ketamine. Lovely. Um, he is the author of several dozen peer-reviewed articles in the mainstream medical press and has written two books exploring psychedelic medicine, The Psychedelic Renaissance and To Fathom Hell or Soar Angelic, Just Take a Pinch of Psychedelic. Uh, in speaking publicly at universities, that was my subtitle I added, by the way. The, the book stops at Soar Angelic. Uh, in speaking publicly at universities and medical conferences, Dr. Sessa is outspoken on lobbying for change in the current system by which drugs are classified in the UK, believing a more progressive policy of regulation would reduce the harm of recreational drug use and provide increased opportunities for clinical re psychedelic research. He's a co-founder and director of the UK's Breaking Convention Conference. And his children are named Huxley, Jimmy, J-I-M-I, -I, and Kitty Lola. I just thought I'd share that with you. So I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Ben Sessa. Thank you for joining us, Ben. Thank you. OK, hi. Can you hear me? Hello, hi. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Maps. Thanks, the whole thing. Really fab to be here. And um, so my talk, really, as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, is I take a very neurodevelopmental um, view towards trauma. And PTSD, and it's quite interesting because a lot of the talk around PTSD that we hear um, is around combat PTSD in veterans. Now, I've been working in psychiatry for around 20 years, and I've seen countless cases of PTSD, but I must have seen about six veterans in my life. So for me, it's not about veterans. It's about child abuse and maltreatment and this maladaptive environment in which young people grow up develop complex PTSD. So I'm going to cover a little bit about child abuse and trauma, a little bit of neurophysiology about the development of the child brain and how a traumatic environment causes physical structural changes in the brain as a child develops. Talk about how MDMA could be psychiatry's antibiotic, and I'll explain about that. Now I'll talk about my work in addictions. So I've moved on to working with adults in addictions as well as children and young people. And then our studies in Cardiff and Bristol. And a final few minutes um, appealing to any young people in the audience who might be interested in a career in psychedelic research or medicine, um, do it. So, what is that? Is that a scared, bruised, humiliated, hurt 11-year-old girl? No. That is a public enemy number one. It's her fault. Piece of scum. She did this to herself. She chose that lifestyle. She's 40 years old now, and she's a heroin user, or she's an alcoholic, and she's begging for your money outside the, the metro station. Don't give her any money. She'll just spend it on booze. Now, how sad, because that is what we do with our public empathy when it comes to trauma. We have all this gushing sentimentality for those little abused children, but we forget that when we see the people in their 30s, 40s, 50s addicted to substances. They've become public enemy number one. And we need to learn to turn back on our public empathy switch that allows us to do this. And the way to do that is to have a good understanding of developmental psychopathology about how a person goes in that direction. So 
My own career has taken the same kind of career as that of my patients. The concept of early childhood abuse and maltreatment that becomes adolescent mental disorder, that becomes complex PTSD, leads on to higher rates of addiction. Because the majority of my patients with addictions to alcohol, um, opiates, cocaine, amphetamine, cannabis, the problems with those drugs, in the vast majority, I'd say 98% of them, they have come from a traumatic experience of childhood. And my own career has brought me to the door of MDMA, and I think this is the direction we need to be going when understanding these patients. So we all hear about the social services radar form of child abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. But in my clinical experience, we see just as many problems with people who are under the radar of the severe abuse that gets in the newspaper. But it's the emotional abuse and neglect that is profound on the development of a healthy psyche. Um, I've worked with so many patients who say, you know, I wasn't physically abused, I wasn't sexually abused, but I always felt that I was not really wanted, they liked my brother more than me, I don't think my dad really wanted me, and these kinds of drip, drip, drip messages, you're not worthy, you're not loved, you're not lovable, you're a bit of a waste of space, have profound effects on the development of psychopathology. Because the important thing being that this attachment relationship, and forgive me, as a, as a child psychiatrist, we talk about two things primarily. Number one is attachment, number two is boundaries. Um, the, it becomes a blueprint for life. The experiences you have, the basic fundamental concepts of trust, friendship, care, play, praise, support, emotional containment, those early years are profound in shaping and development of our personalities. So it's the attachment relationship, but it's also the environment in which young people grow up. High rates of mental disorder and adult addictions are linked to these maladaptive environments. Parents involved in crime, parents who are addicted to substances, unemployment, poor housing, exclusion. And the cohort of patients that I work with primarily are in these groups. And it really is a double whammy. It's a triple whammy. The poor genes, the genes that code for addictions and mental health problems, hang around in the poor areas. And the parenting abilities and the structures surrounding those people, the capacity to have a sense of hope, a sense of, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to get a house. All these things impact on the same group of people. And the nice, posh, rich people have all the nice, good genes, too. We really should do eugenics and make them mate with each other. So it's a real problem, and anyone in psychiatry will know this, that they, you're working with people on the bottom rung of the ladder. So a little bit of a neurophysiology lesson. So growing up in this environment, which is maladaptive and traumatic, actually causes changes within the brain. So we have this system, the amygdala versus the prefrontal cortex, and Phil mentioned it, uh, Michael mentioned it. The amygdala is a very old part of the mammalian brain. It's in other animals as well. It's a very instinctive thing. It's the fear response, fight or flight. Someone comes onto the stage carrying a knife, I'm like, oh my god, I've got to get out of here, I'm in danger, amygdala, jing, jing, jing. Pain, fear, run. Prefrontal cortex is a lot more modern, evolutionally speaking. It's a human thing. Probably, maybe some of the higher primates, but certainly humans have this advanced prefrontal cortex, this area above the eyes, where we use, we rationalize and we use logic and reasoning. You know, this guy coming onto the stage with the knife, Actually, he's got a chef's hat on. He's probably the chef. It's fine. When you have a child that grows up in an environment in which fear is predominantly what's going on, they, they have an exaggerated amygdala response. They, have, they find things more frightening than other people. And they have attenuated, shortened, shrunken prefrontal response. They're not so good at seeing the good in things or themselves. And PTSD, and we've seen this in scanners with people with PTSD, with fMRI, People with PTSD have this exaggerated response in the amygdala, in the shrunken prefrontal response. And PTSD is extremely prevalent. Um, we've really broadened the diagnosis over the years. 10 or 15 years ago, PTSD was a diagnosis that was used for people who had a single life-threatening catastrophic illness, um, um, traumatic experience, like a car accident or a fire or combat experience or serious assault, but we've really, in, in which they really thought they were going to die. 
we've really broadened it now, and we talk about complex PTSD, in which the in index incident needn't be life-threatening, but it could be repetitive again and again, frightening experiences, exactly as we see in child abuse. And the end phenotype is the same as the simple PTSD, predominantly re-experiencing phenomena, flashbacks, nightmares, hypervigilance, high sense of being on edge, high levels of self-harm and suicide. And the really difficult thing about PTSD is it is hard to treat. 50% of people do not respond to the treatments. So there is no single curative drug yet. And there is no single curative psychotherapy. All of them paper over the cracks. They, they, they treat it symptomatically. So if the patient is depressed, give them an antidepressant. If their mood goes up and down, give them a mood stabilizer. If they can't sleep, give them a hypnotic. And if that hypervigilance spills over into paranoia, give them an antipsychotic. So by, by the time they come in to see me as patient, as adults, they rattle there on so many tablets. And none of these tablets actually get to the root cause. They paper over the cracks. They treat the outward symptoms, but they don't treat trauma. And the psychotherapies are the same. We have a whole load of psychotherapies, CBT, EMDR, IPT, DBT, you name it. And they're all good for about 50%, but for a significant 50%, they cannot engage. Because the moment they hear the word rape, they're off, they're out the room. They cannot engage. This is not good enough. After 100 years of modern psychiatry, we are letting people down. And psychiatrists have started becoming feelings of learned helplessness. We don't use the cure word in psychiatry. We consider our profession a palliative care profession. Because if you're diagnosed with severe anxiety disorder or addictions in your 20s, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be still seeing your psychiatrist in your 60s or 70s. That is not good enough. Indeed, I would say we are in psychiatry today where we were in the 19th century with general medicine. Now, back then, in general medicine in the 19th century, our epidemiology was excellent, our classification was excellent, our diagnostic skills were excellent. We knew who got TB, we knew who got smallpox, we knew people died post-operatively, but we didn't have a decent treatment. We treated them symptomatically. And then in the early 20th century, we discovered the antibiotics and we changed the face of general medicine. Now, we're in the same place today in psychiatry. We give people SSRIs and all these drugs and we cover over the symptoms, but we don't have the antibiotic that gets to the cause. We know the cause, trauma, but our treatments are lousy. And we have these excellent diagnostic statistical manuals and the pharma companies queue up for us to prescribe these products that you have to take day in, day out. It's a bit like taking an SSRI for PTSD. It's a bit like taking an aspirin or a paracetamol or an ibuprofen when you have an infection. If you've got an infection, you have high temperature, you feel lousy, take an ibuprofen, your temperature comes down. Great, you feel a bit better. But ibuprofen is not an antibiotic. It doesn't actually get the bug. This does. 3,4-methylene dioxide methamphetamine. It is the perfect tool for psychotherapy. It's short-acting, two to five hours. It's mild in terms of its hallucinogenic qualities. So it's more tolerated than the classicals. Almost always pleasurable. And that's a very important feature in psychopharmacology. A lot of drugs are quite difficult to take. Uh, MDMA either works or it doesn't work, but it's generally well tolerated. And it's safe and it enhances empathy. Now, that's a busy slide, but I want you to have a look at it, because it took ages. MDMA does appear to be the perfect drug for psychotherapy due to its unique receptor profile. So we've got these effects at the 5-HT1A and 1B receptors. This is the kind of ecstasy bit. This is the reduction in depression, the reduction in anxiety, good feelings, positive mood, euphoria also acting at the 5-HT2A receptors, which is where the classical psychedelics work, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, mescaline, which is much, less mild, much milder than the classical psychedelics, but it gives you this sense of seeing things in a new light. It also hits the dopamine receptors, and this, gives, this is the amphetamine effect. Puts you, speeds you up, motivates you to be engaged in therapy. But it also, paradoxically at the same time, relaxes you via the alpha-2 receptors. So you're dropped, like Michael said, into this optimal arousal zone. You're speeded up enough to take part, but the relaxation part 
means you're not overcome by the hypervigilance symptoms. But it's really this effect at the hypothalamus and the oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that's secreted from the brains of breastfeeding mothers. It engenders a sense of engagement and attachment and growth. And, weirdly, MDMA appears to do the exact opposite of PTSD. It shrinks this amygdala response. It makes things less frightening that you normally find scary. And it increases the prefrontal cortex response. It allows you to see the good in things and in yourself. So again, it's the perfect drug. And we're going to be looking at this particular relationship in our Cardiff study with Matt Hoskins and with Chrissy Wilson and uh, John Bisson is the, is the PI on this study. It's a double-blind placebo-controlled study in which we're going to take people with PTSD, not necessarily veterans, um, two groups, crossover study, um, double-blind, and we're going to take them into the scanner and mildly traumatize them by giving them reminders of their, their narrative scripts of their trauma and then look at the relationship between their prefrontal cortex and the amygdala and their fear response on placebo and MDMA. So this hasn't been done before. We've had people with PTSD go into scanners, and we've had people with MDMA go into scanners, or we've had people go into scanners before MDMA therapy and after MDMA therapy, but no one's ever taken people with PTSD, put them into a scanner, traumatized them, and given them MDMA. Um, we thank MAPS very much for the sponsorship of this study alongside Beckley and others. So there's the hypothesis. And it's been done in this flashy new um, facility in Cardiff called Kubrick. It's so new, they're just still putting the scanners in. Um, right, so I'm going to move off talking about that, and I'm going to move and talk about this awful substance, um, killer drug alcohol. Alcohol is really problematic in the, in the UK. It's not so bad here, I don't think. You're much kind of have a much more balanced attitude. Alcohol is ravaging the UK at the moment. It's just out of control. You, people talk about it on breakfast TV. Oh, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm going to get drunk. You know, it's massive. It's thrown at students and young people. Drink, drink, drink. We have a real problem. And people use alcohol to self-medicate against PTSD. I would say that the UK drinks industry is like your NRA an immensely politically and financially powerful institution that somehow allows to buck the trend against an evidence base and yet continues. That's what we have in the UK. Now, will alcohol be treated by MDMA therapy? I mean, maybe not. Dave Nichols reckons not, but I reckon it will. I think it's going to work. If you look at the way, if you look at most of the addiction studies, so far, with the classicals, whether it's psilocybin, uh, the work that Bogan Schutz has been doing, and, uh, and uh, Matt Johnson with nicotine, or even Kropitsky with his ketamine studies, or even way back to Osman's studies in the 50s and 60s, it was the strength of the psycho-spiritual experience that really worked best for treating addiction. Those were the people that remained abstinent. Now, MDMA doesn't generally cause a great psycho-spiritual experience. Mm, around about 10 to 15 percent of people on first time threshold MDMA dose will describe a sense of cosmic oneness and expanded consciousness. But for the most part, it's not that common, especially in comparison to the 80 to 90 percent who would describe those psycho spiritual experiences with classicals. So that's kind of missing. But what we do have is the massive effects on trauma and this ability to have empathy. So we're kind of sticking our necks out a bit with this study. We're hoping that the combination of the co-facilitated th um, uh, therapeutic pair, the effects on trauma and empathy, plus the mild peak experience that you get with MDMA, is going to work to treat alcohol dependence. So we have this study, and um, it's a 10-session, eight-week course of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, which involves two sessions with MDMA. It's open label. Um, because no one has ever used MDMA as a treatment for any addiction, um, we aren't doing the double-blind placebo control study at this stage. It's just open label. They all know they're getting MDMA. We know they're getting MDMA. So it's primarily a proof of concept study and a safety and tolerability study. We have 20 patients. We have the same structure as you've heard throughout the day, male and female co-therapist pair. Um, I'm very fortunate that I came and trained with Michael and Annie as part of my training, and uh, MAPS have been extremely 
supportive with this. So we take patients out of their detox. So they will have had their 10-day detox with chlordiaz epoxide, and then they come out dry, and they come into our 10-week session. We follow them up at three, six, and nine months. So I look forward to presenting the fabulous data on that in a couple of years. Um, I won't go through these, but a whole host of different um, uh, outcome measures, and the, primarily those around drinking and abstinence, but also those around safety. Um, and we're going to be feeding back to MAPS with our safety data for this study. And this is taking part in Bristol, which is a lovely city. I would say the San Francisco of the UK, um, both in terms of how it looks, but also the sheer number of hippies. So a great place to work, and David Nutt is uh, our supervisor on that. And that's me up at Chasen Pharmaceuticals when I went up there to inspect Rick's kilo of MDMA that was being made. Um, this is breaking good, you know. This is, this is the future. This is not a fringe subject anymore. This is proper medicine. And I want to just finish with a few minutes around this issue of if you're a young person considering working in psychedelic research. Now, 15 years ago when I started looking at this, some of my tutors would take me aside and say, Ben, what are you doing? This is crazy. You know, this is career suicide. Why don't you study something nice like antidepressants or something wholesome where you're going to get a job in the pharma industry? Why align yourself with this craziness? But thanks to the likes of Michael and uh, Charlie Grobe and Rick Doblin and supporters across the board that I've met in the last 15 years, I stayed on track. And far from career suicide, it has been the most wonderful thing to do. So any of you young people, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, nurses, whatever, lawyers, solicitors, politicians in the audience, this is the thing to do. Okay? And when your tutor... <laughs> and when your tutor tells you that it's career suicide, you just have to say to them, read your journals. Because if you read your journals, you would know that this is not some fringe, crazy subject. This is cutting-edge newer science. All the top institutions around the world have got psychedelic programs running, major publications in mainstream journals. This is not some crazy fringe thing. So those people who are disparaging of it simply don't understand the field of newer science where we are today. We are eclipsing the 60s. People think of the 60s as the psychedelic era. No, it's not. We are eclipsing the 60s. This slide is already old. We've overtaken the number of studies that are now out there in today's um, psychedelic renaissance, which is the name of my book, if you're interested. And in the UK, we have some fabulous stuff that we've done over the years. Um, it all started in 2009 when David Nutt injected me with psilocybin. Um, the first person to be legally given a psychedelic drug in 33 years. And since then, I've been really fortunate to have worked on these different studies with LSD and MDMA and ketamine and DMT and psilocybin, either administering the drug or being administered the drug. Um, and I'm okay. So I'm going to stop so we can have a few questions. But I have so many people to help that I would like to say thank you to, but... Obviously, all the folk from Rick and everyone else at MAPS and all those folk at Hefter as well and at the Beckley Foundation and at Imperial College for inspiring me and keeping me in tune with this. It's a hard environment in which to work as a child psychiatrist. Um, people are very cagey about the concept of using drugs in people when they have drug problems as adults. They're very cagey about helping people to engage with things that they've spent their whole life trying to repress. And this is what's so hard, because when you, are, when you approach someone at the age of 30 or 40 or 50 with a severe problem like PTSD or addiction, you've spent your whole life doing anything but think about that night when you were six. You've used alcohol and heroin and whatever, self-harm. You've been addicted to drugs. You've been sectioned into hospital. You've tried to take your life. And you'll do anything but think about that night when you were six. And along comes a treatment that allows you to safely do that, that holds you. I think of MDMA like a life vest or a bulletproof vest. It just gives you the emotional containment and security with which to tackle your trauma. That's such a vital thing. Psychiatry has been lacking that. Because this is not 
a public enemy. This is a little girl, and that's why we're doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Ben Sessa. Ben Sessa, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. So we have, yes, Ben. name please uh, hi my name is Chris and thank you so much hi. for this future research and uh, and thinking about child abuse and what those who those children turn into um, and so this 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 is a question about that uh, specifically so you you just um, in the presentation on the phase two trials today uh, Anne said that being poor with low social support would be uh, with the current protocols would be a contraindication for MDMA therapy, and in the phase two trials with, uh, there, with the two patients who had persistent relapse response, it's hypothesized that this was due to being poor with low social support. So um, how specifically can you find hope for your poor, low social support patients? And I really do want the hope. I, I'm yeah. not trying to throw cold water. Yeah, yeah. well, um, yeah. you know, within the context of the studies we're doing, there's only so much support we can provide as the study team. But I think with all patients in psychiatry, there's no magic bullet, you know? Proper psychiatry, when it's delivered properly, is as much about psychological and social inputs as it is about medical and physical inputs. I spend more of my time taking people off medication than I do putting them on it. And I help them with their benefits and their housing and their relationships and their children and their parenting. So all of these things, we work as psychiatrists very closely with the psychological services and the social work services. So. All of our patients will be within those, those frameworks of support. So it's something we're, we're very much aware of. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll squeeze in one more question, shall we? Thanks. Uh, Martin Williams from Melbourne. Good day, Ben. Thanks for all your work. Um, I'll try and speak up. Uh, brilliant metaphor, uh, antibi uh, psychiatry is antibiotic, but, but perhaps a bit too accurate because it also brings up concerns about resistance. Mm -hmm. um, the resistance I refer to and I'd like to, to comment about is given that there are probably countless millions of people around the world who have uh, used ecstasy which did actually contain MDMA. Um, do you have any thoughts about how, how this might impact on the therapeutic potential of MDM, MDMA in the cohort that is actually MDMA? Um, so, so the question is, what's the relationship between the recreational use of ecstasy and, and the work that we do clinically with MDMA? Could it okay. impact on the efficacy of the, yeah, yeah. Of the therapy? Um, well, from a personal experience point of view, somebody who's taken MDMA recreationally, it's a very externalizing experience. It's all loud music, dancing, lasers, taking other drugs, drinking, shouting, wah, at least it is in London. I think it's different in Santa Cruz. But... It's a very externalizing experience. And when I had my session with Michael and Annie, and I had to lie still in a bed in the dark, quietly, on my own, without moving, all of that energy that I was used to shouting and screaming all had to go inside. And it was a completely, radically different experience to ecstasy. It really is. And I think this makes MDMA psychotherapy a really interesting thing. Because if you look at the classical psychotherapies, well, uh, psychotherapies with the classical drugs, the way people take drugs like LSD or psilocybin recreationally is pretty similar to the psychotherapeutic use. They lie down in the dark and listen to Pink Floyd and take their, their LSD like that. But when people take ecstasy, at least in the UK, it is a very externalizing thing. So this could not be more different from recreational ecstasy. And we need to not make inferences about recreational ecstasy use, certainly the dangerous side of it when it's done without due care and, and preparation, about the safety and relative efficacy of MDMA clinically. Thank you so much, Dr. Ben Sessa. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much.